coaching badge. How difficult did you actually find that when you undertook the, uh, the FA prelim badge? Well, it wasn't a problem with the FA because I never took that one. I took the SFA one, the Scottish Football Association one, which um, I find it tends to let the, the coach use his own brain rather than set it, stick to a set of rules, memorise that, and then you become a coach. Um, it's hard work. In the Scottish SFA, we uh, are taught by managers. Like Alec like Ferguson used to come along all the time. Archie Knox, Walter Smith, Alec Miller, Alec Smith. People who have been managers. And people who know the pressures that coaches have got to be under. Um, so it was, it was handy being taught by people who actually been in the game. OK, that's excellent. Now, there's, it's been well documented about you uh, not playing this season. Is that still the uh, intention in your own mind, not to play at uh, Premiership level? I think we've got enough talent here for me to stay, stay in the background. But same as happened last year, if there was a situation arose that uh, it was it's necessary, we're looking for experienced players, and we didn't have the backup in the reserves, I would think about playing again. again. Um, because it'd be selfish of me to say, no, I don't want to play, and if it was, and the team needed me, uh, but as far as I'm concerned, they're retired, but it needs to be circumstances dictate that I would have to put the shirt on again, uh, I would play. Uh, joining me now is Sky Blues Supremo uh, Ron Atkinson. The first question I'd like to ask you, Ron, is why Coventry City when you uh, decided to take back up the, uh, the range of uh, being a manager? A lot of reasons. I suppose the main reason is first and foremost they asked me. Um, the chairman came to see me. Uh, I was very impressed with what he had in mind, for, what plans he had in mind for Coventry City. Um, and I guess that would be the biggest single reason. The chairman interested me enough um, to sort of say, yeah, I'll have a go at that. There's been a number of uh, major signings over the past uh, four or five months. Uh, are there any more planned? Hopefully. I mean, you can never tell with signings. Um, I mean, I think I'm quite happy um, with the players that have brought into the club since I came here. I mean, if you look... Um, the four major purchases, Burroughs, uh, Williams, Telfer and Solarco, they're all, if you like, medium age players who've got plenty in front of them, 24, 25 years of age. And yeah, the other, I'm feeling, of course, only 24, and I think um, he's one I think we'll, you know, we've got high hopes of. Um, Richardson and Isaiah, so coming to the veteran uh, category, but there's still plenty of mileage in their tanks, and uh, they've not cost, by today's standards, they're, vir they're virtually giveaways. A lot has been said in the papers recently about the level of debt at Coventry City. But back in July, Coventry Cable Television were there first. When we spoke with Brian Richardson at the photo session about this very subject. You know, I think since Ron's been here, we've spent well over £5 million. Um, we've taken a million in, or 950000 in, for Presley and Sandy Robertson. Um, but really, it's a question now of we've got to sell some players, um, and those funds are then available again for Ron to spend again. I was asked by uh, a friend of mine if I did get an opportunity to speak with you whether you would confirm is the club still in debt? Oh, yes, of course. I mean, everybody, <laughs> I would think they're, I mean, Arsenal are in debt, if you want to call in debt, but I mean, there's a level at which you can operate. Um, look after your interest payments. I mean, one thing you should always bear in mind is that, you know, bankers control ultimately what you can spend. And if they say, I'm sorry, that's it, Brian, you know, you, you've spent up to your limit, then whatever you say, whatever you do, that's the end of it. So, I mean, we've an excellent uh, relationship with our bank, and, they, and we, in turn, have stuck to our business plan. Um, if you take out transfers, out of last year's business plan. I mean, we made nearly £700,000 profit last year, um, as long as you take transfers out. Now, transfers are a thing that if you're in any other business, you, you would be taking things into stock. In our particular case, in football, it becomes straight off your profit and loss account. And so, you know, that's how it works. But if it was any other business, if you're in a manufacturing business, you'd have spent whatever we spent, £5 million on buying stock. And that's, in effect, what footballers are. Footballers are our stock. At that photo session, there was a feeling of confidence in the camp at Coventry City Football Club that they would do well, particularly bolstered by the resounding pre-season friendly against Aberdeen. Coventry City travelled up to Scotland 
uh, to play against Aberdeen and came out 5-1 winners. Well, it was a, it was a good workout, obviously. Um, Aberdeen were shortly a few other international players, but they still put a strong side as far as they were concerned. Um, we were nearly full strength. Good workout. It was a good day, actually. We, we flew up there. We didn't spend too long in, uh, in transit. We were there in about an hour and 20 minutes. Uh, played very well. Good finishing with Peter and Love. And that gave us uh, time and space in the ball because it was a bit disorganised after that Aberdeen, but we did pass the ball well. And we'd been threatening that for a, a few games in the pre-season matches. I must emphasise that pre-season matches we played before that, that we didn't take as serious as we would normally take a game because it, the, the priority was stamina training until then. Um, previous to the, the, the Cambridge game when we, we got beat, we, we worked uh, very hard for five hours the, the, the day before the game. How important are pre-season friendlies? Well, important to see what you've got and how well your, your, your players are progressing, how fit they're getting. Um, I don't think it makes any, much difference what the, the scoreline is unless it becomes really emphatic for one way or another. Uh, we were looking to get the players fitter, organised, and, um, and, and playing the way we would like to try and get them to play. It was evident from that pre-season that Coventry City were trying to build their strongest side ever, and new signings were made at the club, one of which, John Solarco. Well, John Solarco joins me now, and it's the uh, second transfer deal, John, that nearly fell through. Can you just tell us what was uh, the problem there? Well, there was a bit of wear and tear showed up on the MRI scan. But, I mean, with scans like that, everything's going to show up. I mean, with the rigorous um, medicals you have to have now, um, absolutely everything's going to show up. And really, you know, it's like if I went to a back specialist or to anyone, I wouldn't have a problem. But because a bit of wear and tear showed up, obviously there was a little bit of concern. Um, and when I went up to Newcastle, they decided, um, or the, the chairman decided he didn't want to take a risk. Um, but that was up to them. But then again, I always felt that perhaps they wanted to sign David Ginola, and that was in the pipeline. And from what I've been told, you know, he was more or less signed. They just had a problem with um, sorting his personal terms out. So that could have had a lot to do with it. Whereas when I came here, it was a case that they wanted to sign me. And uh, after I'd seen a few specialists, they decided to go with it. But Coventry wanted to sign you, and you clearly wanted to sign for Coventry City. Definitely. I mean, I'm a great believer in what was meant to be was meant to be. And I mean, I can't deny that it would have been a fantastic move and a great opportunity for me to go to Newcastle, but it wasn't meant to be. So I've got to look on the positive side. You've got a great club here, exciting players. Ron Atkinson's different class, and, you know, a great chairman here is looking to spend money and bring quality players in. There's no reason why we can't be as successful as the big boys. One of the other unusual additions to the fold was the signing of Peter Shilton. Yes, thanks very much. It's, uh, it's nice to be here. I'm really enjoying it at the moment. And I imagine a uh, potential Premier League goalkeeper at 45. That must be an exciting prospect, Peter. Well, uh, I've got to work hard and fight for the place, and that's what I'm prepared to do. Uh, but age doesn't come into it, really. I think if you're good enough, then uh, you should get a chance. Um, you know, I think experience and football brain and knowledge and, and that sort of thing goes a long way, especially with goalkeeping. So as long as my ability is OK, which I think it is, then... Uh, you know, I just have to fight and try and get in the team. The opening fixture of the Premiership campaign, we were unfortunate enough to come up against Newcastle. And although Coventry City were playing a brand, an excellent brand of football, this was not always reflected in the final score. That's not a fault of Mickey Quinn. The, the ball in from... Toby Jones or Mickey Quinn would have been the better option. Let's see what happens. Quinn's deep at the back post and free. So is Boland. And that is an absolutely superb goal from the Sky Blues. A lovely move set up again by Sandy Robertson. The ball played out wide to Lee Jenkinson. What can you say about that one, Steve Walker? Well, again, it comes because they've started to be positive. Referee asks him to take it a bit quick. Ricardo Skimmaker losing out there. And the Sky Blues break three against one here for Coventry City. Sandy Robertson leads the attack. John Williams in support. And Robertson goes for the shot. And that is an absolutely tremendous goal from the Scots. Sandy Robertson for all of 
30 yards. As late summer went into autumn, the reserves went from strength to strength in spite of the, shall we say, predictable moves of fringe players of the club moving on to past Disney. Unfortunately, though, this success had not been at this stage reflected at the first team level. Following the 5-1 reversal at Ewood Park, and in spite of that obvious disappointment, the youth team managed to balance matters, as Trevor Gould explained when talking to Ian Clark. Or well, 5-1 for the first team, Trevor, and 5-1 for yourself. Was it up or down? Yes, uh, thank goodness it was a good result for us. Uh, the boys played exceptionally well, and to score five goals at home is a great achievement. Lincoln City were strong opponents or weaker than you thought they would be? No, they got a new youth team manager a fortnight ago. They uh, held Aston Villa to a nil-nil draw at their home ground, so we had to treat them with respect, but I thought our fo football was of a very high quality. Goal scorers? Yes, uh, <laughs> our little favourite player, Andrew De Crow, got two goals. And then uh, Craig Falconbridge with a penalty, Leon Morgan and Colin Hawkins. So we're quite happy with the, the goal scorers. I have to come back and ask you, were there any uh, set-piece scores? Yeah, there was uh, two set-pieces. Uh, we're working on them very hard and they, they, they're coming up trumps at the moment. But what enabled me to do is that I could get three substitutes on in the last quarter of an hour to give some boys their first taste of youth team football. In October, a quarter of the way through the season, in Clark caught up with and spoke to the boss, Ron Atkinson, concerning those games against Blackburn Rovers and Aston Villa. No, um, two bad results, um, albeit I thought both flattering for the opposition, but uh, nevertheless, it's results that count and we haven't picked them up. We haven't been helped by the fact that, uh, you know, our best side's not playing at the moment, i.e. We've got, we've got key players missing, and we've said all along, when our team is together, I think we can play against anybody. When we have injuries, you know, it, it shows just how short we are in terms of squad numbers. Well, we're talking 5-1 and 3-0. It looks awfully flattering to the opposition. In fact, it looks like we've had a good hiding, but it's not been that way, has it? No, I mean, the Blackburn game was a deaf one, in, in all fairness. I mean, at half-time, we're 2-1 down, and we, in the words of their manager, every time we came forward, we looked as if we'd score. I've got to be honest, second half, we defended crazily. We gave, we gave them some... I mean, Alan Shearer's got a hat-trick, and he really hasn't had to work for his hat-trick. Um, we presented it to him, really. Against the Villa, you know, we, we, we spent a week working on defensive, or I think we, a week working on defensive mistakes. And then within 10 seconds, like before we touched the ball, we're a goal down. Um, so that was a bit of a shock. I thought we played quite well after that for a while. You know, Bosnich did ever so well against us. They defended well. They were perhaps a bit fortunate when Onlove got through and Big Ehihog pulled him down and I think other referees may have sent him off, but that's the way the game goes. And then I thought their two goals late in the game by one of their least effective players um, put, a, put a score line on, which was highly flattering to them. But I mean, that's that's the way we, that's the sort of spell we're in at the moment. What what we badly want? We want we want the Dublins, we want the Burrows, we want the Rennies back into the frame. And uh, when we've got them back in, I think we can play anybody. Play from their right back, which I've uh, chested and gone back towards Goldie. Just gone to pass it back to him and. Uh, I think it was Adrian Heath come behind me, clipped my heel. And as he's tripped me, I fell over and then caught him as he's gone through. The referee's then deemed it that I did it deliberately. Obviously, he didn't see the trip and he sent me off for a professional foul. Once the referee blew his whistle, I mean, your first reaction would have been that you were uh, going to get the free kick. But he deemed it the other way. What happened then? Uh, yeah, I mean, well, after he did it, I thought, he didn't blow straight away, he sort of blew after the after the other lad had gone down. So then he called me over straight away, so obviously he won't give him the freaky cow away. And I sort of knew then he was going to send me off, because, you know, if you had deemed it professional foul, then that's the uh, legis legislation, isn't it? So, you know, he, that's what he went for. The football club immediately asked for a copy of the Coventry Cable Television video, and uh, I presume used that in support of your claim that you were fouled firstly. Yeah, uh, obviously the uh, officials at the club are very disappointed with the decision. Uh, to be fair to the referee, when they went to see him afterwards, he did agree before sending his report in that he would have a look at it if, if they could get the video to him. And uh, I think on the strength of that, I've received just a one-match ban uh, instead of a three, I think. So I think the referee was never going to admit he was totally in the wrong, but maybe he was uh, 
they missed something which he's sort of admitted to.